Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome. This is uh, this morning's B2A CEO Forum. Uh, you are very welcome to join us. Um, just some housekeeping, we are on webinar format, so as people join, and I can see people rapidly joining uh, the conversation, um, we remind you that there is a Q&A function on this webinar. So if you feel like you have a question, uh, please submit them via the Q&A section, which is down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll probably try and gather a couple of questions to share with Derval MacDonald, who is our MC for this morning. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and thank you very much to PwC, who are sponsors of B2A's annual CEO forum. This morning's topic is on resilience and so stabilization. It might feel like we are going through one of the most unusual and unprecedented times as a country, but also society and as individuals, putting pressures on every single industry and feeling the impact of it as we have gone into another uh, type of lockdown. Um, but I'm a big advocate of conversation, of bringing people from different backgrounds and different industries together to hear what's happening in their world, to prompt ideas, to create conversation and to see what can happen as a result of that conversation. So our CEO forum is a key vehicle for doing that and it brings leaders in our network together to hear and to prompt conversations. So uh, to formally introduce Derval MacDonald, a journalist, uh, broadcaster, who is our MC for this morning. She will introduce our panel. Um, Derval is a close friend of B2A and has been involved in both our awards in its judging, has been a presenter of our awards as well, and I know is close to many of our, uh, our board and executive. So Derval, thank you very much for taking the helms of our annual CEO forum. I'm going to hand over to you and uh, thank you very much panelists for joining us. That's great. Thank you so much, Andrew. And look, it is just a pleasure, as always, uh, to join uh, B2A. And um, yeah, I'm joining you from, uh, I'll call it my, my North Dublin studio. Um, we had a little bit of a power outage here last night, which brought home to me the, uh, <laughs> the realities of working from home. But it is great to see you all here. And it's a pleasure to be here. We have three really, actually four fantastic contributors this morning. Um, and what's really interesting is that two actually three of our contributors, actually took up their roles just as the pandemic hit. And as Andrew said, it's sometimes a bit unusual to bring people together from different sectors. But I think that one of the, if I can use the word, one of the ingenious things about this pandemic is that it had nothing, no sector has survived contact with it without being fundamentally changed and altered. And I think that that's something that all of our contributors will agree and share. This morning, I'm going to be in conversation with Miles Clark, who's the Managing Director of CBRE Ireland. He just returned home to Ireland two years ago. Uh, Maureen Canelli is the Director of the Arts Council. And although we know her from all of her extensive work in the arts, she just took up her role earlier this year as um, the coronavirus arrived. Um, Fergal O'Rourke needs no introduction. He's the Managing Partner of PwC, who are, of course, supporting this morning's event. And after our conversation, uh, David Smith, who's the president of the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dublin, is going to give a response to some of the conversations. Um, it is a conversation and we want you to join in as well. You can send in your questions on the Q&A format and you can also join in the conversation online using the hashtag B2A CEO forum. And please do, because it means then we can bring the conversation to people outside of our virtual room and really, really get the conversation going online. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Miles Clark, who's the Managing Director of CBRE Ireland. And uh, you're very welcome, Miles, this morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, Gerald. Yeah, and look, I mean, I, I'm always kind of thinking, you just came home about two years ago, but obviously we were just in recovery in many respects from 2008 and the, the great financial crisis, as it were. But like most sectors, the property sector, which is really a canary in the coal mine in many respects for the broader economy, but it has been significantly impacted by COVID-19. So what have been the big impacts and trends that you have noticed just eight months, sometimes it feels like eight years, but just eight months into this crisis? Thank you, Daryl. Um, you know, it was, it, it, it was like a heart attack in many ways. It just really stopped things in their tracks. Um, and some of it was physical in the sense that a lot of our work takes place on site or physically somewhere else. Uh, and, and a lot of that was stopped. Uh, but a lot of it is a desktop. So there's a proportion that we continue to do. Uh, and it's a truism that we hear about um, COVID in general, that it accelerates other trends that are going on in the world anyway. 
And as you can imagine, a, an area that we focus on a lot is retail. And obviously a lot of our retailers, uh, landlords and occupiers massively impacted by this. Um, the other area and the big question really that probably gets posed in all sorts of form are, around how this is affecting the world is the future of the office. Mm. You know, how are people going to, workers going to get to offices? How long are they going to spend there? And what are they going to do when they're there? And the trends that, again, we saw before, which was increasing flexibility, uh, mixing up of a hybrid way of working between home and the office, um, and having different commuting pat and needing different commuting patterns. Again, that's, I mean, that was a, we were looking at that as a three to five year trend, and it's just absolutely, put it into a huge accelerator over a three month period and see what happens. And that's what we're looking at now. But, but what we're seeing is the, the initial enthusiasm around everyone's going to work from home permanently. We're all seeing that in surveys of workers and in the workplace and staff is increasingly, as we spend more time at home, people are becoming less enamored with working from home. Uh, and I think you, you'll find, we'll find a new normal where uh, people are working one or two days from home. Uh, but that the office is still a very important place for culture, for induction, for training, for collaboration. And it'll just change. It'll just change. And it's really interesting because commercial property really was one of the main drivers. That um, resilience and that resurgence in commercial property was one of the main drivers that, that got us out of the last crisis. So what do you anticipate? Because, you know, you see images of thriving local communities and maybe big or big urban centres like Dublin, you know, um, getting busier. But for a long time, they were just dead. Yeah, yeah, and it is. I mean, when you think about the vibrancy of a city, you know, the saying is, what is the city but its people? And the office is like a channel for that. It's a vehicle where people go to then shop, live, exercise, uh, socialize in the city. So it is, it's really important that uh, we get to a point where and I'll talk about this a bit, bit later maybe, where we're comfortable and confident that an office in general is a, a safe environment. That's number one. We have to get comfortable. Offices are a safe environment as long as there are the protocols in place, etc. Uh, and then it is about transport. And it's been great to see taking that opportunity to improve the cycle lanes. Um, because we know, as a, certainly for Dublin as a city, it's just too limited. You know, the, the access points are tough around the canals. The, the, the networks aren't as well connected as they could or should be. And so we're just going to have to get innovative about what is the other ways that we can all get into the city centre? Um, because I think for everyone, it's probably been a wake up call saying, why, like, uh, why would I spend so much time in a car or, or otherwise getting to, to the office? And I think we're going to have to be creative around what offices mean in terms of you can have your big office in the center of town and maybe there will be a satellite office around for example around the m50 so the, all those debates are going to go on i live in a village on the edge of Dublin city um, and what I've seen and I'm sure everybody has seen is this a real resurgence in resurgence in local communities so people are staying local they're buying local um, and that has been brilliant for local communities but what when you look ahead to what's going to not even just construction per se, but development, when you're looking at future development, what are going to be the implications of that if those trends, if any of those trends hold? Yeah, it's really important uh, and, and developers are increasingly appreciating the importance of creating community. So to make sure that um, when you are, uh, you absolutely respect the community that is there and that when people move to, to, to to a new, say, apartment block, for example, they don't just move for the, the, the spec of the apartment. They move because they like the community. And, and, and we're doing a lot of work in D8, for example. D8 is one of those classic places where it, 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 in some ways it's been forgotten and it's been reserved. There's a resurgence because people want to live in the city. They want to be able to walk or at least cycle into in whether it's starting from kind of Houston Station all the way up to Charlton Square. And we would do work with the ULI and placemaking, for example, where we're supporting and sponsoring um, uh, competitions to, to, to champion really good placemaking because it is really important that we don't separate community from physical space. Um, Was that one of the harsh lessons we learned from the last crisis that we built 
houses and apartments in the wrong place and that they didn't have access to proper amenities, that you couldn't build community around them. Have developers learned that lesson? Yeah, massively. I mean, it's such a different landscape in terms of actually just the, the, the players who, who are now kind of the custodians of our, of our built environment. It's a completely different landscape and the regulations are completely different as well. Nobody, um, you know, when you think about what was driving that, it wasn't so much like it, it was develop, developer ambition, but it was also the bank's um, uh, willingness to lend to build houses uh, in, in literally the middle of nowhere. And we've seen them all these ghost estates. Uh, luckily, a lot of them, are, we've moved on from them. But I can safely say that that, that lesson is, is firmly learned. And the idea that uh, when you're selling space, you're not just selling space, you're selling amenities, you're selling community. Um, and that's really important. I want to come back to, because obviously, the main area is commercial property for you. And I want to come back to how social distancing has already or is going to impact the future design of buildings. Like, I mean, are we permanently going to be walking in with our cardigans around our hands so that we're not touching handle doors? Or will things have to fundamentally change in terms of design? Um, like, I mean, it looks now, you know, just even looking at Neffet and the developments all around the world, this isn't going away. There, this could be something that could be with us for several years. So is it going to change the way we design buildings? Yeah, massively. Um, and it's, you know, if it had lasted two or three months and we were back in the office in the summer, I would have said no. But we know now this is a, this is a permanent, semi-permanent change um, because if we ever, even getting back to normal sometime, um, the scars are deep. No one's ever going to forget um, the impact this has had on our society. So in short, absolutely, it's going to be a permanent effect. Now, some of it's just real small things like, as you mentioned, we've changed all the um, access points here in the office um, so that they're contactless. So doors open and close, contactless, contactless leave. Um, you, you think about stairs and lifts and the challenges they've created. We're going to have to be creative about how people access, have multiple access points. So it's, there aren't these bottlenecks of people all trying to get in at the same time. You think about uh, something mechanical like the filtration systems um, in recycling air. There's so many things that are going to change. Some of them are going to be subtle. And that's to do with safety. And then in terms of the... The, the way we interact with uh, space uh, in offices will change because we can't have so many people sitting close together. You're going to, oh, there's going to be- so we'll be kind of Biden-Harris with plexiglass all around us. Yes, <laughs> yes something like that. <laughs> um, can I ask you, because obviously one of, you talked earlier about how um, pandemics um, and certainly this pandemic has the capacity to, to change things or to accelerate events that were already happening. And one of the questions I have is around sustainability and one of the big issues around climate change and you know obviously the government introduces climate bill earlier this week there is huge pressure at an EU level is there an opportunity here for the pandemic to bring together into design and into the future development real um, a real kind of th that, that that sector can rise to the challenge of climate change and maybe enhance the sustainability of our future buildings and in turn our future communities yeah, I think it's, what's been great is that the, the topic of sustainability that was so high on everyone's agenda at the back end of last year, there was always a risk that, <clears throat> you know, that might slip to the background and we'd have to say, you know what, we have to shorten our horizons, we need to firefight, we'll get back to sustainability in 2022. That's absolutely not been the case. It's very powerful that that is so strong at the agenda. Um, and uh, the broadest terms of ESG, um, in terms of making sure uh, the credentials of buildings and building space are really strong. And there's very clear standards out there now. They're called LEED and WELL. Um, and if they don't reach those standards, the investors are, are, are starting to say, we, can't in, we cannot commit money capital funds to buildings and projects that don't reach those standards. And, but will there be a co an upfront to cost to that? Because like, obviously investors are driving it, consumers are driving it, regulation will drive it. So will there be a need for um, investment in, in that? I know investment is something we're going to be discussing with all of the panelists, but what will be the kind of investment requirements for that? Well, it is investment, but there are also incentives that, that help with that. And there are also savings that come from being uh, 
you know, more efficient with, with your resources. So actually, and, and now you have green bonds and the whole finance side has been greened as well. So that those efficient, it, 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 it's not as onerous or doesn't, as it may have sounded, say, five years ago. And actually, when you put it into the machine, it works. And so it, 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 is, it, is, not, it is not as um, overwhelming in terms of capital in front as, as, a, as, you, as, as it would have been before. And with all those centers put together, it balances out. And in a way, <clears throat> it's becoming binary. It's not a choice. It, it, you don't have a choice. Yeah. When you came into your role, the commercial property sector was still running um, at a health. You described earlier that the pandemic was almost like a heart attack. What was your worst and most scariest moment in the last eight months? And when did you kind of you know, dissipate that overwhelm and just kind of get back into it. Was there a moment where you were thinking it was a bit like that sort of heart attack 2008 time? Yeah, you know, when you see, <clears throat> when you're, there's nothing, there's nothing better that brings to life the, the immediacy uh, and the, the trauma of what you're going through than the stock market, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it just brings it to life to say, to show to you, this is serious. Um, and it did, I was working in finance in 2008, 2009 in London, uh, and it did have remnants of that, that panic of the world has changed very fast and very permanently and in a damaging way. Um, but obviously it was, it has been different. I mean, uh, it hasn't been as bad. Uh, I think authorities have moved faster. The buffers have been put in place much faster. The, um, the furlough schemes have been put in much faster. Uh, and, and, and I was actually quite impressed by the time we got to April, May, although we didn't get our arms around the pandemic, we definitely got our arms around as a wider society, particularly in Europe, got our arms around what do we need to do to stabilize the world uh, to get us through this. Yeah. Well, listen, stay with us, Miles. I'm going to uh, cross over now to you. Maureen Kennelly. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, Maureen Kennelly is the Director of the Arts Council. No, um, Maureen, COVID-19 um, has a, a bit, not, not dissimilar to what uh, Miles was saying, but it has brought to light long-term implications or perhaps accelerating things that were already there. What have been some of the big changes um, in your world? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Great to be here. Um, it's COVID really has experienced a huge paradox for the arts. I mean, we've seen over the last six months that never have the arts been more needed or more sought, sought after, but essentially they've been going through this, this incredibly difficult period whereby they can't operate in any way uh, like they used previously. So it, the COVID has exposed the underlying condition of the arts in terms of the, the very strong freelance nature of the sector. So while we in the Arts Council support hundreds of organisations to through their core costs and to, to do programming and so on, there's a whole other swathe of artists who are, you know, in that very fragile freelance sector and for whom this has been an incredibly different time. It's also exposed the kind of very complex landscape that the arts occupies in terms of there's a, a commercial sector then, you know, particularly in, in, in terms of musicians who would derive their income hugely, especially over the, the summer months, from large scale festival appearances. And of course, that's all been completely obliterated. <laughs> It's, it's been extremely interesting in terms of showing us the very wide nature of the arts landscape. So we have been very much engaged in trying to sustain, preserve that core infrastructure and also trying to commission as many artists as we can. And luckily we've had increased investment from the government. I mean, if there's a good thing to take from the pandemic, it's to look at how the government has listened very carefully to the needs of the arts sector and how there has, in essence, been a coming together of those very wide uh, strands of the arts sector to really make the case, to articulate the case about why the arts is so important. And it has shown how interconnected it is with all those er different areas of society. So listening to Miles talk about, about his particular area, um, and you think about the impact that something like a festival has on its immediate environment, all the spillover economic benefits, that's, you know, those are arguments that the arts sector has been making for several decades now, but actually in the last six months, I think they've been articulated more clearly and are being more clearly heard than ever before. And certainly that multiplier effect of when there is a live fest, I really miss gigs, I really miss gigs, there is music, but you know, just it was like, you know, venues and events closing, you know, severe audience restrictions and the social distancing, it's been devastating for the artists and also so many people involved in the events 
industry who who rely um, on that. But earlier this year, in June, you got uh, the Arts Council got an extra 25 million euro from the government. And I, I think that brought to about 100 million, the overall um, funding that you got. There is a bigger ask looking ahead to 2021 for an extra 30 million euro stability fund. Why? Well, I know why in one sense, but maybe just explain to us, why do you think that that extra injection is needed? It's going to be needed in terms of bridging the gap between uh, the, the loss of income for many, many arts organisations, particularly festivals and those larger venues. So we commissioned EY to do some research for us. Uh, we set up an expert advisory group in May and they reported in June um, under the title Survive, Adapt, Renew. And as part of the work of that group, we commissioned EY to do some research which showed that the arts sector is going to be disproportionately affected. You know, COVID hasn't been a, an equal opportunities impactor. So we know that now, while of course, you know, many sectors are suffering. And the arts, the arts sector has been very cognizant in acknowledging how those, the, the, how all sectors have been impacted. But because of the particular nature of the arts, whereby it's about public assembling to experience high quality events across the country, that's why it's particularly acute for, for our sector. So that extra 13 million is going to be necessary in terms of sustaining those organizations. Decades have gone into building up really strong core arts infrastructure all across the country. And it's absolutely essential that we can sustain them through the, the, the next year, because obviously as time goes on, the, it becomes clear that the, the effect is going to be much longer than we initially expected. So in terms of sustaining them so that they can allow artists to make work and that they can still reach the public. And again, that's been a very striking aspect of the pandemic that they have used all sorts of innovative means to reach their public. And it has been very striking for me that that's one of the first things that the art sector did. They have a very, very high degree of responsibility to their public. So of course they were concerned about their artists, about their staff, about their boards, but simultaneously they asked themselves how can we actually reach the public? Because they immediately recognise that the public are going to be missing out on so much. Um, yeah, and also the, the generosity of um, our artistic and creative community at times brought me to tears during this mm -hmm. pandemic. Seeing them come together to help other organisations, I'm thinking of all those wonderful female artists who came together to produce that amazing rendition of um, Dreams for to, to help you know, uh, families who are affected by domestic violence. You know, hearing the late, the just recently see Derek Mahan on, on RTA, we, 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 re, we really drew on our artistic heritage and on our creative community to, um, if it doesn't sound too strong, to help us kind of get through the, the really hard yards of the pandemic at a, at a soul level almost. We, we really did. Um, and we often use the Joni Mitchell line, the refrain, you don't know what you've got till it's gone, to mm -hmm. talk about, you know, this is exactly why we're missing this, you know, and it's, it's, it's shocking and dreadful that it took a pandemic for us to, to wake up and realise that. But as I say, that's, that's a positive to take from this. Um, one particular from, from my own kind of recent work past Poetry Ireland and Ace Donna, which is part of the Arts Council, worked together to, um, to ensure that hundreds of poets rang hundreds of people throughout the country in April to ring them and say, look, you might be feeling isolated and particularly focused on older people with the help of a loan. Um, you may be feeling isolated. Do you want to hear a reassuring poem? You know, so it's something, a really simple idea, but that has enormous impact that could change a week, a month for somebody to, to actually have that experience, be able to reflect back on it. So, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that artists and arts organisations have shown an incredible generosity, also resilience. And it has been incredibly difficult because as we tilt from one level to another, they've had to be incredibly adaptable. You know, they've been gone through um, a phase where they've thought, OK, we're grand, we're back, we can present something. And then all of a sudden to be plunged into a different reality and to deal with all that has been incredibly challenging for them. But they've risen to it in huge measure.
Yeah. I mean, we are renowned worldwide for our culture, our music, our arts, our theatre, uh, so many disciplines. And it's not just something that we're renowned for, it's actually a government policy. So I look at the policies, including Global Ireland, you know, Culture Ireland, um, even Project 2040, um, puts culture at the heart of Ireland's um, global footprint, whether it's diplomatic. We use culture to open doors. So should it... Um, and everybody's asking for money and everybody has extreme needs. But do you think that the, the pandemic has um, really articulated the case for investment in the creative arts, given the impact it has not just at home, but also abroad? I hope it has. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's a conversation that needs to continue all the time. Um, and I think that when you, when you consider that the Taoiseach has cited the arts very um, prominently in recent in his recent speeches. I think now that that that, that signifies a kind of a new phase for us in terms of people's understanding of where the art sits. But we can't ever be complacent about it, you know. Um, and I think that it feeds back to the articulation that we all need to do in terms of where the art sits, and in terms of showing that the arts is actually everywhere. It's not just over here in one block, oh, that's the arts. You know, it's about the roadside public sculpture. It's about poetry in the classroom. You know, from the age of three or four, we're all experiencing the arts, but we probably don't even realize that. So I think that, you know, it's a conversation that has become, begun now and in a very accelerated way, but I think we, we have a lot more work to do. In terms of globally, we all know how in terms of securing the UN security seat that it, it's off-sited that it was looking to the U2s and Enyas and so on of this world that, that really we, helped. We need for its culture in order to win that seat. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Madison Square Garden. And, but we used, critically actually, and obviously Ireland takes up the UN Security Council seat in January. I think we've already begun as, a, um, as an observer. We've got observer status, but we used our culture as part of that um, armory to win that seat. Yeah, absolutely. And like day in, day out, people are using culture, you know, through the work of Culture Ireland, touring internationally. So it's a very prominent part in the international landscape. So, and maybe back here, we don't actually realise the import that it has. So those are all messages that, you know, now we have a very good um shared platform from which to share it you know and I have to say that the work that we've been doing with the Department of Arts has been immense in the last six months and the degree of understanding of the challenge is is extremely high. I'm on the Cultural Recovery Task Force as is Andrew and um, there are 17 or 18 of us and I have to say the degree of solidarity and progressive thinking on that is really impressive and that that task force will be reporting on October 31st and I, I would be very hopeful that the government will listen carefully and will look to full implementation of our eventual recommendations. It might be a bit of an unfair question to ask the recently appointed Chief Executive of the Arts Council but what has been your standout cultural moment of the last eight months? Well, they have no favourite children, of course, as ever, but, uh, but there have been loads and I realise that I'm in a very lucky position because obviously I get invited to things and I, I know about things before other people. So um, I have been at a few in-person events and again, I realise that's, that's a very privileged position I occupy because capacities are tiny and that's going to be a huge challenge for everybody. You know, when we get back to some sort of normality to have just 50 people in an auditorium. And I guess I just wanted to say that we have a, a very robust equality, human rights and diversity policy. And I'm really concerned that with smaller capacities, that it's not just those favoured few that get to experience culture now in years to come, you know, that's something we have to really keep an eye to. But uh, I was at the Abbey's production of The Great Hunger last Friday in Emma, which really was a treat, very enchanting altogether. So to be brought around that incredible sight was just really beautiful. Um, a Kilkenny Arts Festival did a production with Rough Magic of Mike McCormick's brilliant novel Solar Bones. So those are the in person, but as I say, that'll that 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 will drive people mad. Just thinking, lucky old me out and about getting to see these fantastic events. Um, as we know, people have turned to digital in, in and shown great. Um, resourcefulness in in pushing their work online and indeed in making new work for online channel, channels. Um, so I wanted to mention the Irish National Opera who did a mini series of Mozart's Il Seraglio, which was just the cheekiest, 
most good humoured, inventive, charming. It was really, really beautiful. I think it's still available to, to, to you and I, you know, but they've been doing terrific work. But I mean, there are so many, it's, as I say, it's, it's, it's unfair to single out a few, but um, they've been doing terrific work all around. So normally when a new CEO or leader takes over, they've got all the madness around your first 100 days. What were yours like? Yeah, and then of course in my various interviews, which were in PwC Fergal, so <laughs> fond memories of PwC from back in late January and early February. Um, yeah, lots. I talked so much about change and about connection because those are those are my uh, stumps, if you like. Um, and... Uh, there were uh, obviously I could, and I talked a lot about my first one hundred days. So obviously it's unrecognisable from what I might have described in those in those interviewing days. Um, they have been encouraging in terms of we have a terrific team and the goodwill and support that they've shown me has been incredibly empowering, to be honest with you. So um, and you know it's it's a much beaten path to say that, you know, in crisis, there's an opportunity as well as a challenge, but there certainly has been because it's been an opportunity for the whole sector to cohere together. And that has been very, very empowering, I have to say. Brilliant, that's excellent. Just before I leave you for now, Maureen, uh, Tony Lawless says, well, put Maureen on the wider benefits to the economy and the country of festivals and other arts events. It really hit home during the pandemic. It did. Thank you, Tony. And remember, you can join the conversation on screen or at uh, B2A CEO Forum if you're on social media as well. Um, we're going to move now on to Fergal Work. He's the managing partner of PwC. And Fergal, you're very, very welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm just thinking, if Maureen, Miles and David are relative newbies, does that make you a veteran? Like yourself, Dermot, I've been around <laughs> for quite a while. In fact, uh, I am today, the 8th of October, I am 34 years in the office. I joined what was PW on the 8th of October, 1986. So it's my, my work anniversary today. Well, congratulations on that. And listen, um, you need no introduction, but look, you have over... 3,000 people in seven locations right across the country. And I'm just wondering, like, I mean, how are you adapting to the new ways of working? Like, Miles, did you kind of think this might be for a couple of months and then we'll see? Like, I mean, you're, you're at home um, from your own office. I can't, I can't get to interrogate your, your, your reading list uh, just yet, all the books behind you. But what is it like managing that amount of staff who, for many of them, particularly the younger ones, who thrive on that in-office culture, particularly in the early years of their careers. Yeah, um, you know, when this we, we closed the office in, in the middle of March, we did think by now we'd be back to normal. So there, there is an element of, of moving and dealing with it as you move along. One of the big learnings for me was, was culture and values, because from a technology perspective, we've invested a lot in technology and in the, in the culture of the organization over the last couple of years. So standing up the organization, been ready to work on Monday, 3,000 people from their own homes or wherever, we were able to do that. But for me, the bigger issue was culture and values. And in the last four or five years, we'd spent a lot on the culture of the firm and the values of the firm. And I think that was an investment we made, which is really coming back to serve us now. And it, as part of that, we communicate much more openly than, than many firms, I think. And in the first few weeks, I went out to our people and I said, look, uh, I want to lay down a couple of principles here. One of the principles I laid down is that the partners as economic owners of the business would bear the, the financial brunt of this crisis. And that for as long as possible and as far as possible, we were going to protect people's lives, livelihoods, and we were going to protect their jobs. And it's, it's the, the payback we've got from being that open about it has been fantastic. I mean, we, we've done a couple of pulse surveys of our people and uh, it, it, it's that sense of communication, that sense of belonging that has been really important to them because we were scattering 3,000 people to the wind, to their own homes, and yet trying to create a, a sense of still belonging to the PwC tribe. And I think for good businesses that invested in culture and values, they're able to hold that sense of belonging, notwithstanding the fact that their people are, are spread all around the country or even further afield at the moment. So there's the practical aspect of getting an organization running up again, but there is the glue. And you are right, we are a learning organization. In, in Over the next uh, six weeks now, we will have 350 graduates join us, mostly by remote. 
And one of the things we've been focusing on as, on our leadership team is how do we make sure they get as normal as possible an induction course? So for example, provided we stay at level three, we're going to bring them into the office in, in bite-sized chunks with the people they're going to be working to. So they get some sense of the office uh, over the next while. But as an organization, that's one of the key focus we have at the moment. You know, how do we retain the benefits of what we've learned over the last six months? And how do we make sure we don't lose the benefits of the office until we're all back uh, together in the one place again? With that, you know, essential skill of, you know, it applies to my sector as much as anybody else's. It's the hustle. It's the going to the conferences. You know, you, you get more contacts and probably do more business at the canapes table than, than you might yeah. get elsewhere. You know, where are you going to get that you know, so, you know, that's a vital aspect of training. And if, even if you stay at level three, that's going to make that very difficult. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a great advocate of management by mooching around, uh, particularly in the office where you get to, to meet people. It's amazing, again, and this has been, you know, what I call sit led from within our organization. I was talking to one team last week and we have on a Friday morning at nine o'clock, they all log on and have a virtual cup of coffee. And no business is discussed. Just for a half an hour, they catch up on what's going on in everybody's lives. Um, and that, that, those sort of things help. Those sort of things were, were you know, I, I have noticed each team is, is, is engaging a little bit more. But you know yourself, it's about being in the room, when I'm, like particularly we're a learning organization. So being in the room and watching how a partner behaves during a meeting. During a meeting. Not just how he, he or she speaks, but how they listen or how they pick up the verbal cues. You, you need to be there to breathe the same mo molecules and learn. So there's no doubt that is a loss. And But to your point about the canapes, it's very interesting. I sit on our European leadership team meeting as well, and we have 10 meetings a year. And six of those meetings are usually in person and four are by phone. And I would always go over the night before and I'd meet a few of the guys or gals for dinner and you'd go out and you'd catch up on the real scuffle about what's going on and indeed at the breaks. But I think going back to normal, whenever that would be, that'll switch from being 6-4 to maybe been 3-7, uh, 3 in person. I think there is a place for in-person meetings and always will be. But I think we're going to find that remote working or smart working, as we call it, is going to have a bigger role in, in the new normal whenever we get back to it. Most business owners know that the only thing that's certain in life is uncertainty. And that was really something that was underscored in PwC's annual CEO survey, um, which, you know, really articulated that un that uncertainty is, as we know, a large part of business planning. Um, you have really tried to, in that survey, to, to recommend or to kind of, I suppose, hammer home that investment in your people and upskilling is a way to keep your staff agile, engaged and adaptable. And if there's anything probably that we all need to be at the moment is adaptable, but that creates its own uncertainty at both a personal and an institutional level. So can you maybe just let, tease that out a little bit more for me about that, you know, and it's, it's interesting because no matter whether your sector is arts or business, that investment yeah. in people seems to be one of the key, another kind of element of the glue, Fergal. Yeah, well, I suppose if I go back to when I started my career, the only really uncertainty was the economic uncertainty. Yeah. And that rose and fell with the, the, the economic cycle. I think what we found in the last couple of years is, in, certainly in the last decade, we've layered on a technology, technological uncertainty, just the pace of change in technology, the things we do with our phones and our iPads uh, that were just unimaginable a decade ago. We then, over the last four or five years, have had political uncertainty layered on, everything from you know, a, a new dynamic in the US over the last four years to the Brexit uh, outcome. And now we've layered on, on top of that, a pandemic uncertainty. So I think um, all of us are living through times which if we presented the people who went before us 30 years ago and just dropped them into this, this scenario, I, I think they would be overwhelmed. We've become used to it because we've lived through it as it's evolved. But if you took somebody from the 1980s, think a, a management position and dropped them in now, I think that it's the same basic skill set, but I think they would be overwhelmed by the technological change, the pace of change. So I suppose from, from our perspective and from really good businesses, it's, it's sort of giving people the resilience and the skill set to deal with that. So can I just give an example on technology? When we went on started on a journey about two and a half years ago, 
uh, to become the most technology enabled professional services firm in the country and the most digital enabled professional services firm in the country. Of our 3,000 people, we've put over 80% of them through a digital academy now. And that's equipping them with the tools to, to deal with uh, the modern way of working, let's call it. But at the other end, in resilience, we now have mental health uh, uh, support programs. And I come from a generation where you didn't talk about mental health. It was seen in some ways as a sign of weakness. Whereas now, I believe we're equipping a generation of workers to say, it's perfectly acceptable to fluff your hand and say, you know, I, I'm having mental health issues. So I think for the modern workforce, you've got to give them the technology skills but you've also got them to give them the resilient skills. And if you give those coping skills and technology skills, I think whether it's a pandemic change or a political change, or we will be able to cope with them. But companies just have to invest in their people, more so than we've ever done before. You mentioned the B word, I didn't first, uh, Brexit. Um, oh. The SRI reporting that uh, this morning, uh, that um, in its latest quarterly report, that economic growth could have um, by next year. If you uh, were reading Bloomberg first thing, they're a little bit more optimistic about a deal, but um, it really is a, a perfect storm of a global pandemic meeting with the prospect of a no deal Brexit. And when, when it, the B word first it came into being, um, uh, PwC got a, a little bit of flack because it uh, predicted a no deal. Yeah, we back in 2017, uh, March 2017, we actually, against the tide at the time, said, you know, if you look at the, the red lines of the, Euro of the European Commission and you look at the red lines of the United Kingdom, uh, there was no way you could come anywhere close to a deal. So our prediction back in March 17 was no deal. And I remember the time talking to my UK counterpart, I said, oh, no, 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 we're very confident of a deal and we've been talking to number 10 and it's definitely going to be a deal. Um, we haven't changed our view uh, as we've gone along and we still believe a no deal is the most likely outcome. Now, you know, um, we are coming near finally the end of the road. We've had little... Uh, deadlines before that we've, we've got around but from the 31st of December the United Kingdom will no longer be part of uh, the European Union with all the consequential trade impacts that it has and you know I, I take some hope of the fact that um, uh, the UK negotiators are saying now that fisheries is the most uh, difficult issue left. Fisheries is about 1.4% of UK um, GDP and while it's, it's an emotive issue you know British fishermen should be allowed in British waters and all this crack. Um, you know, if they're, if they're down to something that's that small, I, I live in hope there would be some sort of agreement. But the type of trade agreement that was envisaged maybe two years ago and the type of trade agreement that's envisaged now, there is a big gap. And whatever it'll be, it could be pretty bare bones. I still worry about the internal markets bill in the north, what will happen. But business will have an entirely new set of obligations on the 1st of January that thankfully most of them have prepared for. So I would say to businesses, keep focusing on the business issues the political opera will play out and hopefully over the next couple of weeks, but businesses will face big changes. Yeah. Thank you. for. There's been loads of questions coming in and quite a number asking what role, um, I know Kieran McSweeney um, amongst others asked, was what role could or should the private sector, whether it's corporate or individuals, have in supporting the arts, um, in particular given how the arts sector has been disproportionately affected. I might maybe just throw that over to you, um, Miles, maybe just to ask you that question. How can you know big entities like yourselves get involved and support the arts and why does it matter for firms that you do that? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was just very interesting listening to Maureen there about you know, I do feel as if the sector is grossly underrepresented and underappreciated because, as you said, on this UN Council pitch, you know, we're very, very good at rolling out our heritage and our art and our advocates at that time. But when it comes to funding and really, really giving it a leg up, I think we lack. Um, and yeah, like if you think about it, if you think about the way. Uh, corporations are moving around, uh, along their, their value add. It's gone from the Excel spreadsheet to the Steve Jobs creative outlook on how do we figure out stuff. The technology is there, we'll do the hard work in the background, but it's got to be a creative outlook that fixes problems. And they're the skill sets we need to, to absolutely need to support in business to be successful, no doubt. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not that binary. You're either good at maths or you're not. That's just not going to cut it anymore. 
Um, and, and, and that's, that's a general point. But uh, when you think about um, the, the things we discussed earlier, community, built environment, placemaking, all that, all that requires um, a creative artistic outlook. And also it, it requires artists to work with business, which is why business art is so important, that artists know how to interact with the corporate world. Because there is a real appetite. There's a real appetite to, to have artists and residents, artists and residents, or work with local community art groups um, to get a better understanding and have this blend so that we don't have this harsh corporate world and then this, this, this other creative world. There's a real appetite to bring it together, but they do speak different languages. Um, uh, but it's, it's absolutely important. And you saw the, the, report, the report that went out from ULI on the, the issues around the North inner city uh, that was commissioned there about 18 months, two years ago. And they had the, the mayor from Baltimore and all, all these uh, really experienced forward thinkers uh, uh, come around the table and go, look, how do you crack these really deprived, difficult inner city uh, neighborhoods? And, and it was very clear, art. You know, art is the answer. It's the way you engage people. It's the way you give them aspiration. It's the way that they talk and you, 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 the way that they interact with the world is absolutely key. And I think we just forget that. Uh, we underappreciate that. Um, I want to just ask more in the world and its granny is obviously asking for extra funds, whether it's arts, health, you know, business, everybody is looking um, for money. But just from a perspective, obviously you've put in your budget submission, you've asked for that extra, but how as a, le a business leader, do you plan in such an uncertain time? It's something that it affects every business. Um, but how are you trying to get your head around planning for 2021 and beyond as the world waits and watches for a vaccine or, or some other solution to what we're facing? We have a very agile sector um, and our team is in constant communication with the organisations and the artists that we, we fund, Dergal. So we're asking them to think imaginatively as they always do but even more so now and like there have been acts of heroic imagination that, that they've shown this year so we're, we're saying to them look we absolutely acknowledge that this is the most complex backdrop against which you'll be making your application but think expansively you know what's the most you need try and be realistic you know nobody knows whether you know, the wage subsidy scheme will be extended um, people have no idea of what kind of audiences they can have, have in, what kind of work they can make. So we're asking them to consider the outer limits of what they can do next year, you know, while still understanding obviously the, the, the gross uncertainty. And because they are agile, you know, they will come back with, with good plans. And our twin or our parallel concerns in our strategy are the audience and the artists. So we're asking them to keep those absolutely to the front of their minds. And we're also asking them to consider two other policy, corporate policies, our equality, human rights and diversity, and our pay the artist policy. And back again to, that, to, to the underlying condition, the payment that artists have received has never been to the level it, it should have been so that's that's something that's a very core concern of ours and now in the midst of the pandemic it is an even more urgent concern there, for the whole sector. There have, there have more and been so many questions I would love to have the time to direct them to all of you. Uh, Bev and Cody says are there any interesting new models of engagement between business and the arts emerging in the new virtual world? Willie White says to Miles earlier point about sustainability cultural provision is important to sustaining communities and fostering social cohesion I don't think there would be anyone who would disagree with that. Um, we've had a fantastic conversation that I think uh, could have gone on for, for much, much longer. But before we close, I want to introduce our final contributor, um, who has, I think, some good news to share with us. But it is David Smith, who's the president of the IADT in Dublin, and um, he's going to respond to some of the issues raised by the panellists. So, um, David, you're very, very welcome. Good morning, Darville. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to Business Starts for the opportunity to participate. Um, I very much enjoyed uh, the conversation. It's very, very wide ranging and touched upon a, a lot of things of immediate concern um, for myself and my own role, but uh, obviously uh, the broader cultural sector. Um, I think what the first thing I would like to say is um, the point that the conversation was about resilience. I think we're six months into the pandemic and we've demonstrated immense resilience to, uh, to be able to deal with all of the challenges that we faced uh, in our own discrete sectors. And um, I don't think we step back um, and reflect upon actually the challenges that we faced and actually what we've done to, to arrive where we have. Um, and I think credit to, to everybody um, 
not uh, not only on the call but those who are who are uh, listening in in actually being able to sustain um, their 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 businesses and and the cultural uh, provision that they have with the greatest of challenges. Um, Yes, in respect of some good news that you said there, Darville, I think uh, too often um, we bemoan the fact that we are not getting investment directly into support um, the creative and cultural sector. And i um, very, very happy to say that um, on uh, Tuesday um, we received a confirmation that the government were investing £10 million in the Creative Futures Academy, which is a new initiative between IADT, the National College of Art and Design, and Humanities in UCD. And um, the Creative Futures Academy, while it's focused obviously on supporting um, and improving the skills acquisition for the future of work, changing work for for our undergraduates within the institutions, um, it's primarily also focused on the CPD needs of the broader cultural sector. So some of those deficits that that you know freelance practitioners or cultural practitioners have within their kind of current skill sets to allow them to uh, adapt and change to to the future uh, future demands of of, of work, um, and possibly in such circumstances like that we're facing today, to be to be able to pivot and to bring their kind of their their creative uh, expertise um, into other quarters and, and exert their influence in, in those areas. So um, to, to echo Maureen's point in respect of the, the additional subvention that we've received in the cultural sector, it's a very, very rare day to see such a significant amount allocated for arts and humanities given the strong STEM agenda. So we don't see too much around STEAM and, and the value of, of art or creative practices at the intersection of those, um, those other disciplines. So I think credit where credit is due to see that investment been made uh, while it's within education it, it will have broader impacts upon, upon the broader cultural and creative sector um, I have a lot of notes here I'm not going to be able to kind of respond to all of them and, and, and as I said the conversation was very very wide-ranging um, but when I was um, doing the uh, obligatory curation of my bookshelf behind me um, uh, yesterday evening oh. <laughs> I, I picked up uh, Nicholas Taleb's book, The Black Swan, and I was just reading the back cover of it and, and the concept of, you know, the impact of the highly improbable. And, and I started asking myself was, or is, you know, the pandemic, pandemic a, a black swan? And, and, and arguably, based on his, his thesis, it's not, you know, that we can explain it and, and we have history and experience of it. But actually, certainly its impact, I think when you look at its impact, I think uh, it, there's no question that none of us could have anticipated the consequence of impact, either universally, but when we look at our discrete areas, whether it's culture, enterprise, or education, um, the impact is, is significant. Um, and I think what's very, very important listening to um, the panelists is that there are significant learnings achieved, whether that is how we integrate technology, how we repurpose our working week. And I think learning from the changes, learning from the last six, mo six months is something that I think we need to consider and, and not lose sight of the opportunity that Maureen spoke of, that, you know, that we have to be honest with ourselves, have things changed for the better? Quite often not the case, but we have learned huge things, how we can use technology. And I think technology as an enabler, I think that's vitally important that we're not uh, beholden to technology, but technology that will allow us to drive cultural changes and make things better. And I think that is the, the underlying sense that I got listening to the speakers was that there are opportunities for better, better whether it's in our urban planning, as, as Miles has said, better in how we create the culture of our organisations. And, um, and Fergal's view around, obviously, leadership. I, 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 I I'm very much like Fergal, you know, I, I like the management by walking around approach. I think it's very, very important to, to know what's happening and, and be available. But certainly within um, my organization, I've seen a huge change for the better around communication and transparency because in a crisis, we, we work together. And I think that's vitally important. And I've seen significant um, generosity of spirit, um, both within my own organization, but across the sector. And I think if we are much more collegiate towards each other, I think we can come out of this in a, in a much, much stronger way. Um, and, and that I think is vitally important. Um, and taking from that point, I think when we, when we look at maybe the soil approach and many of the participants have mentioned the value of the arts, I, I think we have a very established perspective on, on the arts. I think, as you said, the, the Irish economy trade perpetually on our global, on our cultural credentials globally. But I think we need to look beyond what I would say is just solely the artistic output or, or the events or the things. I think there is significant value in the difference of, of our thinking and our practices. And this is a hugely untapped resource. And I think that if we are 
going to emerge in, 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 in with innovative solutions and, and face this disruption. I think um, engaging with artists and designers and cultural practitioners in broader conversations in, in other sectors, I think there will be immense potential there. Um, so to, to Maureen's point, I think, um, I don't think we continue to, to trade exclusively on the creative or, or cultural recognition um, unless there's further adequate supports and wider recognition of that transformative potential. I really believe in it. I have to believe in that as an educator. I have to believe that the creativity and the resilience that, that uh, young artists and young designers bring to bear will have significant impacts. But I also believe that the existing uh, broader cultural community, artists, designers, and practitioners can actually make contributions beyond our artistic practices and our partners in business and enterprise. I think if they engage with them outside of art for art's sake, if you will, and see actually that the thinking and the, that, that they can bring additional expertise and drive maybe interdisciplinary changes and, and that we can think, think very, very different, differently around um, the opportunities that, that are ahead of us. Um, I think there's immense opportunity. So I'm sure there's others that are other things that I can pick up on, but that, that really is a, a quick surmise of, of, of some of the opportunities. And I think just again, reflecting on, on the views, I think there are, there are opportunities At, in the eye of the storm. We're, we're, we're all in crisis management, but I think I've certainly with my, my colleagues, we've started to reflect on our future strategy and we've started to think about those opportunities and what they could be. And just in a closing remark, while I opened with the, the uh, great news of, of, of 10 million commitments. There was another announcement by the um, department yesterday and we received a very, very, very small amount of money, um, but it, it's actually a very, very significant amount of money. It was seed capital for the Institute of Art, Design and Technology to explore and pursue the potential for a national university of the creative arts in Ireland. And I think when you look at the commitment that was made earlier in the week for the, the Creative Futures Academy, and then the seed capital to allow us to explore that, that certainly demonstrates that there is a recognition of the value and the inherent sustainability and, and, and to put creative practices at the center of, of um, you know, education and create a university for, for the creative arts. That, that is a huge opportunity that exists now. And uh, I think with supports of Maureen and, and our other industry partners, I think um, there's immense potential to put creative practice right at the center of this conversation. Thank you so, so much, David. There, all of the messages and responses are coming in thick and fast. I won't get to all of them. There's Neil Murray at the Abbey Theatre, but perhaps one that uh, really sums up perhaps this morning's conversation is from Dee Forbes. Of course, his Director General of RT says, art in all its forms helps us understand our experience so that we can begin to heal. Let's all find even more creative ways to support the sector in the months ahead. I just want to say before I hand over to Andrew, thank you to Fergal, David, Maureen and Miles for making this such an easy and enjoyable um, task for me this morning. What the conversation really brought home for me is something that I've always known is that um, the business case for uh, the arts has always been strong. I think now in the wake of the pandemic, it's overwhelming, but also just that capacity for arts and business to collaborate, to come together, to actually build and sustain a better society um, and to uh, not just affect culture in the creative sense, but also the cultures in our organizations and, and where we work and live. So listen, um, it has been an absolute privilege to be with all of you. Thanks for joining us on screen and online. And with that, I'll hand back over to Andrew. Thanks a million, Daryl, and thank you very much, panellists. I uh, found this morning's conversation both stimulating but also eye-opening in terms of some of the specific issues that people have addressed and overcome. Um, it is an unusual time, and as we go into 2021, I think one of the most important things I can, I can emphasise is the leadership the arts sector have shown in the move to digital and the quality of digital content that's been produced by some of our outstanding artists and arts organisations. I have to single out a few myself. Maureen did a great job, but uh, I believe some of the work that other uh, voices have done in showcasing our national cultural institutions, uh, the high, high quality filming and recording of our best musicians and performers has been world class. I also think uh, some of the shift or agility that's been shown by our festivals and events, bringing productions that might have originally been planned for uh, in venue or outdoors rapidly moving them online in high quality formats is another example of agility and fast moving pace that sometimes the art sector shows to other sectors. And I think if you're a business looking to try and generate really unique content or to think about creative ways that you can engage employees, either young or uh, long-term, like our panelists uh, reflect, come to the arts. 
talk to them, see what type of plans that they have, and to see whether you can integrate that into some of your events in 2021. But the corporate sector is a significant part of investment in the arts and has been growing. And as we move into 2021, the ultimate advocacy that I can do is ask business leaders to continue that support, to look to the arts, to see ways that they can support communities through the arts and to come to business to arts. We are a membership based organization. We have recently announced a 1 million euro fund with Bank of Ireland to support communities and artists all over the island of Ireland. And it is a model that we can replicate and do again with different needs, different stakeholders, different territories with companies. So if you have discretionary budget, if you are seeing some of the positives of the pandemic and you have available budget, come to us. We will find ways that you can support artists and arts organizations in truly meaningful ways. So um, Derval, as always, expertly moderated, I really appreciate you coming and joining us again. And uh, we look forward to working with you again in the future. And to our panelists, thank you very much. It is just after nine o'clock this morning. I hope you have all have a good day's work. And to everyone that has logged into us, if there's anything that you'd like to add to the conversation, it is hashtag B2A CEO forum. You can still put on questions there. We'll try and share them with people that they may be relevant for or try and answer them as well. So enjoy your day and thank you very much for joining us everyone. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thank you.